Okay, so our, our next presentation uh, this morning is by Rich, and he's going to be talking about integrating different types of tagging data into stock assessment models. Thanks, Mark, and good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Good. You're right, Jim, this is a bit weird. Uh, so I'm going to talk about integrating uh, electronic tag data into stock assessment models. So why do I care about that? Well, I tend to do a lot of work on large pelagic species, and you can't get this kind of data for every kind of species, but it is a lot of the kind of, you know, most people who work on pelagic species like nothing better than pinning something to an animal or inside it. So we do have a lot of this kind of data, but today it does get used, but not traditionally in that integrated assessment kind of sense, right? We look at it, people have probably been to meetings and seen lots of really cool tracks of animals, but it doesn't always tend to make it into the models. So what I want to talk about today is how we might go about doing that. This is really weird because I can't even see what you lot can. Uh, can I change it? Yeah, cheers. Yeah. I do want to look at you. I don't want to just look at that, but I, it would be good to know what you're looking at. Yeah. Is that right? That's not the point of this process, Jim. Come on, mate. Thanks. I'm going to get the prize for most awkward in two minutes. That's great. Thanks, Simon. Don't worry, we're starting. Back on. You're welcome. Uh, so I really want to talk about sort of what kind of groupings you would put them into. There's lots of different types of tag data, right? And they sort of, I think they group into a few sensible uh, groupings that you could think about a way of integrating these into the kind of models we're all talking about now, the one we might want to see in the future. So I think the first grouping that I would sort of think about is archival tags. They require someone to essentially, they're kind of like conventional tags, right? You need somebody to recover it and to report it. But if you do get it back, it's kind of like a conventional tag with the added bonus of it tells you where it went as it was at liberty. The second type of sort of satellite tags or I guess you could consider acoustic tags without reporting rate information. Similarly, you get often quite detailed time location information. And the third one are acoustic tags. These are ones where you usually fit on or inside an animal, some sort of acoustic emitter, and you have an array somewhere. And as it goes past, it pings the array and you've got some idea where it was. So what I'm interested in is given these three general groupings, and I'll try and convince people that it makes sense as a grouping, uh, how could we include these in integrated assessments? Not just use them to figure out movement hypotheses, but try and use them to actually estimate movement. So what do you get from them? Well, if you've got archival tags, if you've got reporting rates, like I said, they're basically a conventional tag. You get information on F. In theory, if you do the modeling right, you'll get information on M. And you'll also get an information of when it was at liberty, where has it been? With a satellite tag, you often get very detailed history of where it's been. Sometimes you get daily reports, sometimes not. The trick there is if it's feasible to condense that information up to where your stock assessment time frame is, because there's very few, if any, assessments I know that are real time. You also get some sort of tag and mortality information from a satellite tag, like if you're watching a satellite tag and you're pretty sure you've put it on, if suddenly it stops moving, is usually the only one reason why that happened, uh, it's probably dead. Uh, for acoustic, you can sort of think of this, this will give you information on total mortality. It's, off, it's not really going to give you much on fishing mortality. It'll probably give you the cumulative effect because if you keep seeing that tag, it must be surviving. So it's got information on survival. You can't really pin that down to F, but it gives you that survival information. And if you have a decent detection array, that should give you a balanced spread of where it's been. The additional wrinkle is with acoustic tags, you have to figure out what that observation probability is. If you set up an array of receivers Depending on how that animal's swimming, it's not always going to ping off that receiver, even if it goes close to it, right? So there's a chance that you'll miss it. But that's anyone who's seen sort of Cormac Jolly Seba models or things like that. That information is sort of embedded in the data. You just have to tease it out. And I think that's why they sort of go into these three groupings. What are the generic challenges? Well, I don't think it's feasible to do one ETAG module, mostly for what I said in the last slide, because they each have different requirements. The probability models for each of them is slightly different. But I do think 
it's feasible to do module, whatever people want to call it, for those kind of groupings in certain circumstances. So data compression is the big one. Often with this kind of data, it's really detailed. Sometimes for acoustic detections, for some of the things we have, there are 100,000 detections over maybe three years. That's not really something you're going to want to just bang into a model, right? You have to think about how you're going to scale the data up to the model. And sometimes there's going to be circumstances where that's going to be hard to do, but not always. The key bit as well is the representation of the uncertainty of what, where it is and when you saw it. It sounds really simple that it must be, it was there then. The reality of a lot of this data is it's quite uncertain, especially at the assessment scale, where you saw it and when did you see it. So there's a few little wrinkles to sort of represent, but in general, if you can manage the data compression side of things, I certainly think it's doable. The other thing is obviously covariates. I mean, simple ones, uh, Nick touched on it yesterday, was age or length, but some things it could be, I don't know, moon phase or whatever, but the general thing about including covariates to help you model the movement correctly. So I've got two case studies. The first one is Southern Bluefin Tuna. It was essentially a simulation evaluation uh, piece of work to look at conventional archival tags and catches. And the idea was, what does it really take to estimate age structured M, age structured F and movement? Can you really do it with just conventional tags or do you need archival tags as well? The second case study is South Pacific Stripe Marlin. It's a bit simpler. It's basically conventional and satellite tagging only. Uh, I'm only estimating movement and it's a quarterly time step with two regions. So it's pretty simple. But there are two examples that hopefully show there's three of the four data types you could possibly use and how I think you should or could be able to integrate them into these kind of assessment models. Well, Nick sort of presaged most of this yesterday, so it's pretty useful. I think if I understand most of the general models, they have different ways of parameterizing that spatial transition matrix, but they all tend to use one. I'm pretty sure Multifan does. Uh, I'm pretty sure Synthesis does. Uh, I don't know about the other ones or Gadget. I'm looking for, yeah, there's a nod. That's good. So they all tend to, in different ways, end up with a matrix usually fixed in time. It doesn't have to be. And it's usually however many regions you are. If you've got R regions, it's an R by R matrix. And it's that probability of if you're in this region, you'll go to that region. So depending on how you want to parameterize it, the sums of the columns sum to one. All of the things I'm going to talk about use that. So hopefully that sort of suggests that all the ingredients are actually already in these models. So all of the movement models that I'm going to go on to talk about and the likelihoods for the data basically stem from this. It's a pretty simple movement model. So if you know where you start off, where you release that tag, which you hopefully would, you've got this state vector and you've got by one where it starts and zero everywhere else. And if you apply this matrix over time, that just tells you the probability distribution over time, where that animal thinks you sh it should be, given the model. So that's pretty simple and efficient. And it's just this thing here. So this is going to form the basis for most of the likelihoods. So it's something that seems to be in all of these models, pretty simple ingredients. I think the likelihood is definitely going to vary by tag. So naturally, I'm going to pick the easiest one first. I think the simplest case is a satellite tag. So we're thinking only about movement. The general idea is you'll go out and you'll have, I don't know, you'll tag any animals with satellite tags. And each one of those gives you an individual tag history. So at a certain point in time, sends out a signal that tells you where it is. So this is the simple case. So let's go through that one first. The likelihood is really just a product of those locations of where it was given the last time that you saw it and you see it there now. So this is directly from what we saw on the previous page. That conditional bit is essentially taking care of that track history, right? It's not that you know, you see it multiple times and that just takes care of that conditional track history as you go through time. It was there last time I saw it. Model thinks it should be here now and you compare it to that. That's pretty simple. The wrinkle is always going to be you're never really going to know certainly where that tag was at that certain time. That's the reality of it. And that's something that needs to be sort of modified to take account of it. But the simple case <coughs> is actually pretty simple and all the ingredients are already there. Why don't you know exactly where it is? Well, there's probably two things. Most electronic tags have certain imprecisions. Anyone who's worked on tracking data or filtering tracking data know that Certain methods have certain errors that go along, but you're not always exactly sure, like light-based geolocation, 
or satellite tags or even acoustic tags. You're not always exactly sure where it was. The other bit is fine scale dynamics. You know, we talk about boxes. They don't know about boxes, right? So if you've tagged an animal and it's swimming up to the edge of the box, it might go across the box, it might come back, or it's not always as friendly as just going straight across the box in the time frame you'd like it to, which basically means you don't really know that location thing for sure. But both of those things can be dealt with, right? You certainly with tracking location algorithms, you can get an estimate of what the distribution is possible locations is at a given time. That's possible to do. I think the, the hard bit with this kind of data is going to be most of your work is going to happen before you fit the model. It'll be getting to that point of understanding the probability distribution of the observations in terms of where you think that tag was at a given time. It's getting to this point. Instead of a series of track locations, it's a, essentially a series of probabilities of where you think it is. It gets a bit more involved, like the previous slide. It's basically expanding that out into there, that uncertainty. So the first bit here, it's basically, where do you think you are now, given where I last saw you? This bit is the data updated distribution of where it was the last time that you saw it. So that's a product of where the model thinks it was and where the data thinks it was. And this bit here is obviously your observations at this given time about where you think it is. It's basically just integrating across the fact you don't know really where it was the last time you saw it. You're not entirely sure where it is now, but it's the same principle. So if that sort of makes sense. You can write it in a very esoteric and efficient way as people have, some people know probably what hidden Markov models are. I imagine a few people have worked on them, but I'm just trying to get across that uncertainty and the fact you're never really sure really where it was, but this can be recast in a really efficient way as a hidden Markov model. All right, that's the easy one with satellite tags. Archival tags, if you have reporting rates, it's basically an additional likelihood structure. Most of the models you have for conventional tags, it just builds on that. Like for the SBT case I'm gonna show, it's basically, uh, people know the Brownie model, spatial Brownie model. It's the best way, I think anyway, to estimate M and F from tag data. It's basically a spatial Brownie model with a little bit of, you've got that track history in between. So you basically embed the track history into a spatial Brownie model. It's easy to say, it's horrible to look at, but it is doable. All of the ingredients are there in the models to do. For acoustic tags, you have to take account of survival, obviously. You get these detections over time. You have to model the probability that it survives through time. And you also have to estimate the detection probability as well. But again, if you cast it as a hidden Markov model, it's basically embedding a spatial Cormac Jolly Sieber model into this. That's really all that it is. And it's fairly doable. All right, so I'm going to move on to the case studies. So the first one is Southern Bluefin Tuna. This was a simulation study to look at the utility of archival tags. They're not cheap, and, you know, we certainly get the reputation at Saro of just always asking to go and tag stuff. Unsurprisingly, people wanted to know, well, we want to know what you're going to get, you bang for your buck. Are you really going to be able to understand movement better because we've released a lot of conventional tags? Is it worthwhile? The data sources are conventional tags, archival tags, and captured age, which just scales everything to abundance. The key questions were really, how do you disentangle age-based mortality in terms of fishing and natural and movement? That's quite a lot to ask. Some are of the view that you can do that with conventional tags only. Hopefully I'll convince you that might not be true, but certainly in this case, it was to ask, can you really disentangle all these three and do you need archivals to do it? So just to give you a rough idea, on the left, in the summertime, these red bobs here are the release locations and the recapture locations of conventional tags. So a large proportion of the animals seem to come here in the summertime, feeding, hang around in this place called the Great Australian Bight. And then in the wintertime, they disperse into the Southeast Indian Ocean and the Tasman Sea to go and feed on the feeding grounds here. This is usually between the ages of about two and five. After that, they never come back to this location. So it's very handy to be able to tag from here. There's also a fishery there every summer. So it's one of those places where we can release tags and also get them back. But there's also obviously recaptures in the, the long line fleets. So it sets up the idea for the model in the sense that for the summer, a proportion of the animals are here, they get fished, we can release the tags. As you get to the end of summer, a certain fraction of them disperse into those three areas in the Southeast Indian Ocean and the Tasman Sea. They are fished, we get some recaptures back, hopefully. Uh, and by the end of that summer, a certain fraction of them decide they're going to come back and a certain fraction of them stay. 
So you can sort of see the motivation for that structure given that kind of recapture and release profile. So what we really want to know, and the key question here as well, and it's one of those things that's quite common, I think, to a lot of tagging programs, you don't get to do releases in every single area. Often you're quite restricted in terms of where you can actually release tags. And in our case, it's pretty much restricted to here. So that makes it quite difficult sometimes to estimate movement because you're not releasing animals here. Hence the, the possibility to use archivals because they can fill in the gap for you. So on the left, we've got the estimates of the movement parameters in terms of the CV. Going up here, it's the number of archival tags. Coming across the x-axis, the number of conventional tags. And here are the two uh, natural mortality parameters. And you kind of see, the more you increase the archival tags, you seem to get better estimates of movement. The CV is going down as you increase that. It's not seemingly happening for the conventional tags. You keep adding in more conventional tags, it's not really moving the needle, right? You're not seeing it go from light to dark. The flip side is true for natural mortality. Not totally, but you sort of see, if I increase all of those archivals, I'm not getting a strong transition in terms of the precision I'm getting in M, but I am if I'm going across here with the conventional. They all have different things to say about those different parameters, and that's where the utility of the archivals come in. For the F estimates, it's a bit of a mixed bag, again, because archival tags are just... I don't know, I'd call them conventional tags with added history, basically. They still tell you about F because you have to model the probability of recapture. So you do get a good sort of spread in the sense that adding in both types of tags is likely to increase your estimates, your precision in terms of estimates of F. But for the movement, everything seems to be with the archivals. And for the M estimates, it's almost all in the conventional. So they all have different things to say about those different processes. So clearly archival tags can be informative. The big question is, are they informative without them? I think it depends on the release and recaptures in terms of where you're able to get releases at. We have a clearly heterogeneous release structure. In theory, if you don't have those archivals, you'll never know, are they coming back or are they dead? So they do have a utility. If you really wanna separate those three processes, I think it's hard to do with most realistic tagging programs without that kind of spread. Uh, I'll go through the strike modern example. So this one's a bit simpler. Thank you to Nicola for this picture. So these regions in the South Pacific here, these specific numbers, I think if I understand it, are fishery locations in terms of definitions, but the actual spatial structure is either side of 165 East. This sort of artificial thing, it's not that artificial. It seems to be a significant biogeographical spot over which there seems to be differences in migration and other things. So essentially it's about figuring out how many striped marlin go that way, how many striped marlin go that way. So this is, I think, 73 tracks, estimated mean tracks of striped marlin. The yellows are animals that were released this side of the line, close to Australia. The green ones are released just to the right of that line, but close to it. And the black ones were released, I think, just off New Zealand. And this just gives you a different plot through time of year. So instantly you can sort of see, this is satellite tags. They don't send to Tay on for very long. I think we got a max of about a year in terms of time at Liberty for this. It's a quarterly movement model, but in reality, it's, it's not a long-term data set. In that sense, you've got at most three or four movements max from some of these animals. But you do tend to see a pattern and it's pretty clear. They don't want, seem to want to go that way, but some of the New Zealand releases do cross that line. The other bit is we've got conventional recaptures. Now, this is a recapture only model because I'm only estimating movement. Why am I using recaptures only? Because I don't want to bother about M, I don't want to bother about F, and I don't want to bother about tag shedding. I just want to know movement. You can sort of think of them as a piece out with one observation. You have to make minor adaptions for the relative probability of recapture in a region, but it makes it easy to estimate movement. If you just consider recaptures, not the releases also. But the recaptures also say something fairly stark. There were 61 recaptures that were released in the Australian zone, and none of them were recaptured on the other side of the border. Region 2, there was 26 recaptures there, but 10 of them, uh, 10 of them were captured in Region 1. So it seems to back up what it's saying. That there seems to be this asymmetric movement from that New Zealand South Pacific side into the Australian zone, but not the other way, which is lucky for us. Uh, so we integrate these two data sets given the sort of likelihood structures I've shown. 
Uh, and sure enough, what you see is that you can fit. Trust me, there is a blue line behind there. It's probably the best fit I've ever had, but it is there. Uh, and these are the fits to the given recapture release region two, the fits from one and two. So you can integrate these two sets of data together in the same way that you could do it. You could do this very easily within a stock assessment model. None of the models are different. All of the ingredients are the same, but it's a, a really good way, I think, of estimating movement directly. So wrapping it up, I don't think there's any technical problems with doing this. I think all of the ingredients, they're already there. Everything I showed you today and used today, they're already there in most of these models. I think the grouping makes a lot of sense. I hope so. Archivals with reporting rates, I think they should be treated on their own. Satellite and archival tags where you've only got reported tags, not releases and uh, reporting rate information. You can use those the same way as satellite tags because they still give you a track. Uh, and acoustic tags you have to treat a little bit differently. But all those ingredients are there. Now, I mean, I've used two examples at work because I'd be a bit dumb if I didn't. But there are obviously going to be wacky model dynamics and field work choices that aren't going to work in these kind of scaled up in time models. If you've got, I don't know, every time there's sunspot activity in a J in the month, they all go to one corner of one region. That's going to be pretty difficult to represent in these kind of models. But you'd hopefully realize that before you tried to do it. Equally, if someone just goes out and tags animals in one corner of one box, that's probably not going to give you representative information. But that's, if you get put crap in, you're going to get crap out. But I think if you do it right, it can be done. Uh, with the SBT example, it showed that if you have archival tags, you can disentangle all those key processes. And with the stripe modeling, that you can pretty easily use data to estimate movement directly. And I think I've got on a bit, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. And I'll hopefully answer some questions. Okay, thanks, Rich. Uh, we have quite a bit of time for questions. Yeah, Jim. Thanks, Rich. Uh, just on the hidden Markov part, is that, would you take something like a Kalman filter distribution? And I'm just trying to understand how that would work. And what I didn't get was whether you're integrating over like a daily thing on a quarterly time step or what is, I, I think I understand that, yeah, you know, you have some probability of being in a different area, but most of your probability is in one area, but how does it integrate over time? Yeah, I mean, it's usually, there's, there's probably a few steps, like at least in the one I showed, yeah, there's probably a hidden Markov model used to filter the raw data itself, you know, to actually filter the tracks. And that's probably one step. That wasn't the Markov model I'm talking about there. That's more that forward transition of the probabilities. Now, if you want to filter back, you have to go backwards in time to get filtered tracks of where you think it was. That's more like pulse model processing, right? If you wanted to assess the fits to the data, you have to do that. But in terms of writing that likelihood, it's just the most efficient way to do what I sort of clunkily showed on the screen of taking care of the fact that through time, you're updating your distribution of where you think it is given the data. And that hidden Markov is, a, is perfect for doing that because the structure that it has in a spatial sense, it's perfect for doing that. So that's probably a, a somewhat obtuse. I'm happy to go into detail later if you want. Yeah, just to clarify that, if your archival tags um, record the location every day, but your model is basically quarterly, how do you do, deal with the difference in that spatial strat other temporal sp stratification? That's the hard bit. Like it's, it's one of those things I think a lot of the work, if you are going to use this stuff, is done before you really put it into the model. It's getting a sensible aggregation. Like for the SBT, it's reasonably simple. The model was structured in a seasonal sense that most of the animals, you look at the tracks, they're there in the summer and they move out in the winter and they either stay out in the winter or they come back. So those transitions are usually well-defined. So you can block chunks of the year where that, the location is effectively almost non-perfect. There's some cases with the striped marlin, which is not going to be that clear. So I think if it scales up, you'll probably know about it when you look at the raw data. If they're really moving around really rapidly relative to your spatial and temporal scale, I think you're going to struggle because that's not capturing the fine scale movement. So I think it definitely has those limitations. Okay. Yeah, Anders, you had a question? Okay, so, so, you know, I've seen people do this before and there's, you know, you choose the cell that they were in the most during that quarter or you give probabilities to each cell of the probability of being there and things like that. So it, it's really complicated. Also, each observation, daily observation is correlated. So your effective sample size for that data is going to be really problematic as well. So the, this, 
there's issues that need to be resolved, I guess. And I think that mostly at that compression scale, it's, you should not, I mean, so, I think there's some cases that will work. Obviously, I'll pick some that I think do, but I think there will be a lot of cases that don't because you'll have those problems. There'll be such, I don't know, serial autocorrelation in the tracks that in theory you could map into the likelihood. It depends on how good the filter information you get is. There's a lot of ways to do it, but yeah, most of the work is going to be deciding, getting those data compression right, the probability distributions right, and ultimately being realistic about whether you think what you're seeing in the real data can be replicated sensibly in the model. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, um, down the back. Yeah, I had a question about your weighting. Um, so with the conventional tags, you have a lot more numbers of tags. So is that gonna be a higher influence on your overall model fit than the uh, acoustic or the archival tags? Because they're gonna have a temporal time series, I'm assuming, for each tag. Uh, for the conventional or for the archival? For the, for the archival, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's data weighting, right? You have to do the, use the binomial in this case, but you know, beta binomial, so that the weighting you hopefully do at estimation time. But again, if you have a lot of tracks, that is a lot of data. So, I mean, it's gonna have more dominance. You have to get the data weighting right statistically through data weighting or right weighting, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, I, it's like fitting any kind of integrated data series. If you get your data wrong, if you get your weighting wrong and there's differential signals, it's gonna look weird. Yeah, um, oh, John. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rich, enjoyed the presentation. Um, just looking at the Stripe Marlin example, I think you had a, a number of satellite tag releases that were pretty close to the boundary. Are you able to take into account the distance from a boundary in, in estimating the probability of movement across that boundary? So you could parameterize it that way, I guess like you would, I guess in multifan, like if you wanted to parameterize it in terms of that diffusivity, there would be a way of, for each track history, I would imagine it, it would almost be that the transition matrix has an individual variability conditional on where it was released. So you can spec these things up again. It's about how do you parameterize, I guess, that transition matrix. So it would get a bit funky in that sense, but it's certainly doable. Like I chose the simple one in this, this case, but you could add in that kind of complexity. Yeah. Yeah, Nesta. Um, uh, I was wondering about uh, interactions between your transition matrix and uh, the displacement of the fleet. Did you look into that? Because I, as I understand from what you're suggesting is that in fact is that transition matrix that is the input that can be used on a stock assessment or currently could be used. And uh, I'm assuming that that transition matrix actually has some dynamics over time, especially if there is an interaction with the fleet on a stock that may be overexploited like a lot of them. Yeah, you're making it sound complicated. I wanted it to look simple. You're right. Obviously, there could be a lot of reasons why that transition matrix isn't stationary. Uh, you hope to God it, it is, but I think there are a lot of situations where it's not. Yeah, that's about almost like adding covariates and dependencies and things. And obviously, it's easy for me to stand up and say this, that you could do anything you want to add into that transition matrix. Obviously, having good enough data to be able to estimate that is key. But there aren't usually limitations sensible limitations, but you could link, link in those kind of factors. Okay, um, I, I got another question. So in the um, catch, uh, what was it? Recapture conditioned analysis and the, the satellite tags, um, is there any situations where the fishery or other components of the model might influence the results? And if not, would it be better to analyze the data outside the model to create the transitions and then put them into the model as prize on movement or something like that? No, it's a good question. I mean, certainly with the recapture condition, you're, you don't need to know absolute recapture rates, but you do need to know at the time of recapture, what's the relative chance that it's gonna get caught in that region versus the others. That links obviously to the fisheries because depending on which fishery it came through, you don't need to know the absolute reporting rate, right? but if that fishery is twice as good at reporting as that one, that's gonna influence. Or if their effort is twice as high in one region than the other, you're always gonna get more of that side than this side. So the answer is yes. And I think it's right to make a judgment call is, can you handle it outside, which is what I did here, versus in some cases, I think it's probably easier inside for things like relative probability of recapture. But equally, if there's some issues around that, yeah, I guess there's a case both ways. Like if it's flexible enough and you can use prior approaches to, in, you know, to you know, integrate that data in a different way, then that's definitely doable. 
as Rick uh, following along on that, we're just thinking that it could be that the probability that a significant part of a fleet has moved to an area so that it can do recaptures is partly dependent upon a large fraction of the fish having already moved to that area and been detected there. So I'm worried a little bit about uh, the mm. dependency of the, uh, the estimation on the, the movements themselves. Yeah, I guess you're right. We should probably give fishermen some credit sometimes. They probably know reasons to go to places yeah. and they're not independent of what you're trying to measure. So no, it's a good point. Okay, I think Adam had a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, just really the comment about um, making sure that your tagging design is fit for purpose as well, because you're applying these movement coefficients essentially to transfer the whole population by age class, assuming a homoge again a homogeneous distribution of that population within the, the area. And so I think caution needs to be applied when you look at how your tags are being distributed in that area to come up with those coefficients. No, I think it's a really good caveat and probably a few of us have always been stung by you getting tag releases from people that did not consult you as a, to the tag design and you turn around and say, well, why did you do that? That's pretty unbalanced. And there's not a lot you can do with it at that point. If the data is unbalanced, you're not going to get sensible stuff out. So it is a good point that, well, I guess that we should be involved in tag design programs and talk to people. I think it's a, an important thing to, to factor in. Okay, thanks a lot, Rich. Thanks.